Ernie Cato with this week's number one song. Not necessarily my number one relative. With that comment, I guess I better be packing my bags. Here's Ricky with a song that's quickly taken over the number one spot. He must have insulted his mother-in-law, too. I'm a traveling man, made a lot of stops all over the world. Before a joint session of Congress today, President Kennedy gave this country a remarkable challenge. I believe that this nation should commit itself to achieving the goal before this decade is out of landing a man on the moon and returning him safely to the Earth. Did you hear that? Are we going to the moon? That's what the president said. That message by President John F. Kennedy, May 25th, 1961, brings back many memories. But it really hit home for the people of South Mississippi when the government announced five months later to the day that it would build a test facility along the banks of the East Pearl River to test those rockets that were going to the moon. The newspapers uh, throughout the area carried the announcement of the uh, location of the test site. Generally, a uh, quiet, settled community. It was a lovely place. I, I was somewhat familiar with the fact that uh, Honey Island Swamp between the two Pearl Rivers was, uh, was sort of a no man's land. Uh, also, Devil Swamp over to the east of the site here uh, was. Uh, uh, most just just in low timberlands the original policy for acquisition of the test site was the the operational area uh, where all of the facilities are constructed uh, contained 13,500 acres uh, that was bought outright including the mineral interest the buffer zone which was approximately another 120 plus thousand acres uh, the original policy was to acquire only a perpetual restrictive easement. One of the reasons this area was selected, of course it was a number of reasons, a physical reason, but one thing, this marvelous river we had here, and then low population. Where could you find that much acreage and move that smaller amount of people? The project was under overall management of the Marshall Space Flight Center in Huntsville, Alabama. And the people up there were really excited about the selection of this Pearl River area for the test site. After all, it was just a short distance down the Pearl River and across the inland waterways over to the Michoud Assembly Facility in New Orleans, and out out the mouth of the Pearl and around the tip of Florida to Cape Canaveral where you would launch the rockets. But even though the area was sparsely populated, NASA did have to move five communities to make way for the construction of the facility. It were Westonia, Santa Rosa, Napoleon, Gainesville, and Logtown. The Gainesville community was a unique community. Uh, the Loveless Grocery Store, Mrs. Louise Loveless, uh, who operated the store with her husband, uh, was sort of a focal point in the community. Around the corner from the grocery store, there was a lady, and I don't remember her first name, but she was referred to as Aunt Blue. Her name was Aunt Blue Davis. When we acquired her home, uh, as a lot of the others did, uh, she didn't have it demolished but she reserved the right to remove it. And she had a house mover, as I recall, his name was Daly Dronet uh, from the Gulfport area, who loaded that house and uh, took it up around the Nicholson area. 
Aunt Blue Davis never left it. She sat on the back porch in a rocking chair and went down the highway with that house. And I can still see that lady today. And I think she had maybe a niece, uh, I believe Mrs. Freeman Davis, that rode with her uh, as that house went down the highway up old 43 to the Nicholson area. A lot of us look on Senator Stennis as more of a statesman than a politician. Yeah. He told us that if any of you have any trouble dealing with the Corps of Engineers on doing the eminent domain, you call me and I'll see what I can do. And he did help people who called him. It was a daytime meeting, and the way they handled the questions and answers, they had couriers, and I was one of them. People, if they had a question they wanted to ask, they had to write out the question. And then we would take it up to the podium. I don't know who the lady was. I took her question up, and her question was, why do we have to go to the moon? Senator Stennis answered that question in this way. He said, we have to go to the moon for international prestige. Senator Stennis had another quote that day that became rather famous. He said, there's always the thorn before the rose, the thorn being eminent domain, the rose being the opportunity that those people had to play a major role in America's prestigious space program. I was highly elated, very proud of America. I felt that, I, I'll tell you why I felt that way, I felt that we were part of it since we had given up our land and moved and everything, that we were actually part of going to the moon. We had uh, the challenge of building a very large rocket test facility. Uh, it was a swamp here. There wasn't anything here except the Rushan house, which is behind us. Uh, the challenge was significant. In today's dollars, that would amount to a billion dollar facility. Uh, we had to build it from scratch. And when it was completed, it was going to test the awesome Saturn V rockets that were going to take men to the moon. Jerry has been associated with Stenny Space Center for almost his entire existence. In the Apollo days, we uh, used to see Jerry once a week as he flew down from Washington, where he was responsible for overseeing the construction of the Mississippi Test Facility in those days. There were schedule problems. The S-2 stand was a critical facility, was determined to be the most critical facility in, in achieving the Apollo uh, mission. And therefore, there were lots of pressure to complete the construction on schedule. We did not know at the time what all it took and what all it was gonna take to really uh, construct and, and to put together the type of facility that's required to uh, support the space program. But as time passed and as we continued to work and, and continue to lay out the, um, the boundaries and, and the foundations uh, for construction, the roads began to appear, uh, power lines began to, 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 to appear, uh, buildings began to appear, then, then it started coming together. We had to clear an awful lot of land. We had to put in an awful lot of facilities, many of which were very highly technical facilities, uh, very high pressure systems and, and uh, liquid oxygen and hydrogen that was going to be required and the test stands over to uh, a little further to the east of us. Our responsibilities for us in the early days was to, to, uh, to uh, construct the facilities, get it to a point to where it could be operable. And all during those days, it took about three years for us to finish and finalize all the facilities that's now known as the Stenny Space Center. The construction activation phase brought out the very best of everyone. It was characterized by superb leadership. Dr. Werner Von Braun, director of the Marshall Center, appointed a Navy captain, Bill Fortune, as first project manager. Captain Fortune was highly respected by his employees and especially popular in the communities. The first American flag to fly over this site, symbolizing NASA's presence here, was raised by Captain Fortune and Dr. Von Braun. That event brought on a reminder 
of Dr. Von Braun's early involvement with this facility. He was not merely an overseer or a visitor. He was a participant. In fact, he often referred to this South Mississippi site as his baby. You know, he was a fine gentleman and a true professional and really knew how to get everybody's consensus to his ideas and how to move them forward. And uh, Carl Heimberg and Bernie Tessman, his deputy, were in charge of his test laboratory up there in Huntsville. And we worked very closely with them developing the requirements for this facility. Carl was a hard driver, uh, but a very, very tough and fair man, very focused on where uh, he wanted things to go. Tessman was a, had a, a good personality, had a good sense of humor, and he uh, filled in some of the people gaps. But both of them were fun to work with. And of course, we had Henry Order and a gentleman named Garden Artley was uh, significant in bringing together the focus to get this place activated with three or four thousand uh, new employees coming on, plus three thousand contractors, and get things done. Ken Riggs was uh, outstanding in bringing together the test experience and requirement to our planning team. Some people think I'm kidding when I tell them that. During the month of July, we had to wear a jacket, a denim jacket, or some other form of jacket that was thick enough to uh, prevent the mosquitoes from penetrating your, your clothing. Uh, rainy season, there was a lot of mud, and so that slowed things down. Uh, when we excavated for the test foundations, there were holes uh, 40 feet deep, and so you got down to where water wanted to just bubble in the bottom, and we had to put in more deeper and deeper wells so that we could pull the water table down. Uh, congestion, I mean, there was work going on everywhere here and uh, uh, just lots of activities happening simultaneously. We had that snow, about a 10 inch snow uh, down here in Mississippi. We did have some unusual problems during construction and sometimes resorted to resourceful methods to solve them, even to the point of using mules to do what modern machines couldn't accomplish. One of the photographs taken of that activity became world famous. That picture was real famous. That picture went around from coast to coast, they told me. My boss asked me, he say, do you know how to plow a mule? I told him, yes, I do. It was kind of wet, soggy. Mule was kind of boggy, but we made it. In the spring of 1965, Jackson Balch was appointed manager of what was soon to be officially named the Mississippi Test Facility. And with him, he brought other leadership from Huntsville to fulfill the mission. Jack Balch asked me if I would come down uh, and be a project manager on the uh, S2 program. And uh, it just looked like an opportunity I couldn't turn down. Uh, working for Jack was uh, a real learning experience too. Jack Balch was a unique uh, character, a lovable man in many ways, a tough taskmaster in many ways. He certainly would, it would certainly would be an understatement on my part to say that he left an indelible mark here. Again, he was a hard-nosed individual, but uh, you like Jack automatically if you like confidence, because he was a very competent individual. It was just the people more than anything. Pe people tend to remember the hardware but it's really the people that made the hardware work. There was considerable excitement in the air in those days with the anticipation of building and testing the vehicles that would get us to the moon. People were being trained. We were learning how to handle large volumes of hydrogen. It was an exciting time for sure. Everything was out of the ground facility-wise. We were putting in cables, terminating cables. Uh, S2 was uh, getting ready to finish out at Seal Beach and be shipped in here. and. Uh, it was just a real beehive of activity getting ready for the first test. And uh, as you remember, the S2 was probably the most controversial of the, uh, of the Saturn V stages in that it was liquid hydrogen, it had a common bulkhead, uh, and expected, expected a lot of problems. Well, it was pretty, uh, pretty difficult because we were running round the clock, uh, no days off. You know, it wasn't anything like a weekend. You just kept right on going. 
coming up to the test, uh, everybody was pretty tired. But I can remember the feeling that, uh, that they certainly wanted to get it off, and there wasn't any question about we were going to do it. It took some 25 hours after the blockhouse was sealed to get that test off. Lots of bugs in the system, things that had to be worked out, but ultimately we weren't successful and the test was a major accomplishment, a major milestone. And uh, at that time they had the countdown of the, the test firings on the you know, operational intercom site-wide. And everybody would listen to the countdown and as it got to the last few seconds, you would, if you could, go outside so that you could see the smoke and hear it. The rocket testing started in 1966, and every rocket that was tested here performed its mission flawlessly in flight in taking our men to the moon. Like all Americans, I remember it well, uh, being at home with my family, keeping my kids up all night so that they could see this historical moment, and then finally seeing Neil Armstrong step on the moon and having a sense of pride that I had some little small part of that. All the, all the people here at uh, MTF in those days, as we call it, the Mississippi Test Facility, felt an enormous amount of pride in the fact that we, uh, we had a major role in, uh, in making that happen. The people at MTF and their neighbors didn't have long to enjoy the laurels of that fantastic mission. Even as the nation was celebrating that first lunar landing, an ill wind was brewing in the Gulf of Mexico that would change the destinies of thousands of people and the directions of the Mississippi Test Facility. Camille came along, devastated the coast, killed several of our employees, damaged our facilities, and it was a time when our people came together. Hurricane Camille focused the attention of the country on this area, and uh, NASA bowed its back and said, we want to help in this area, and NASA provided substantial help uh, to the area, not only by continuing the operations here, but in many other ways in the local community. The MTF management team, under the leadership of Jackson Balch, was engaged in a diligent search for new roles and missions even before the tragedy of Camille. When we started hearing about the Mississippi Test Facility and the fact that uh, the rocket testing was phasing down here, uh, we were asked to think of things that could be done here. Assistant Center Director at uh, Johnson Space Center, Bob Pilon, was asked to define an activity to be implemented here. And he defined this laboratory. NASA established the Earth Resources Laboratory at MTF, and a number of federal and state agencies were also invited to utilize the facilities. A plan was set out to convert the Mississippi Test Facility from a single agency, NASA, single mission uh, propulsion testing to a multi-agency, multi-mission federal laboratory. Uh, a great shot in the arm, however, uh, was in the 1970 time frame. Uh, the committee met in early 71. Uh, NASA decided to put the uh, testing for the space shuttle main engine here. During his first term as administrator of NASA, Dr. Jim Fletcher decided that the installation should be renamed and its reporting changed. In June of 1974, MTF became the National Space Technology Laboratories. 
That was in recognition of some of the application and technology type projects that this facility became involved in after the Apollo era. I was asked if I was interested in coming down. There was a vacancy. Jack Balch has uh, retired and uh, Henry Otter, his deputy, was acting uh, in his capacity. And NASA asked me if I'd come down and lead this facility, and I, I said yes. And uh, he served a distinguished uh, period of time, 12 years. And really, his major contribution, in my view, was that he took uh, this installation from the fringes of involvement with NASA programs to the center line. And during Jerry's tenure, we had uh, uh, major improvements in our involvement with NASA, uh, our relationships with other centers, our involvements in the programs. New programs were assigned to Stennis, new facilities were built. Uh, Jerry's knowledge of NASA, his leadership ability, and his knowledge of how NASA headquarters and the Congress work uh, sure did pay off for all of us here at Stennis Space Center. That was a great day. It was a recognition uh, by NASA that uh, uh, this installation is part of the family, part of the family of NASA. It was a day that we honored a great Mississippian and a great American. He had a great deal to do with this place. He was like the father of this installation. He worried and worked uh, for its advancement and its progress ever since it was established. And uh, he, in addition, had not only supported the programs that were here in Mississippi, but he supported the entire National Space Program. He felt it is the right program for the agency. He supported Kennedy uh, when he announced his uh, intention to go to the moon. And therefore, it was a great, good feeling, not only for me, but all the employees of this installation. We feel that Senator John Stennis got the test site for us. And uh, I think we owe him a, a great debt of gratitude for the, his effort in that. John C. Stennis, I call Uncle John, because uh, this was his second home. He just loved to be out here. I felt like that when they changed it to Stennis Space Center, it was a long time coming for John Stennis because he deserved everything Every recognition has been given him. Through the efforts of uh, technology and, and through everybody working together as a team, uh, Stennis, you know, has, has grown even more and the shuttle program seems to be uh, moving, moving forward or moving ahead uh, with tremendous strides. The whole thing comes to Roy Estes. Ever since I met Roy Estes, he has always been the guy who could exude confidence and, and everything's going to be all right, hang in there. Well, the people, the team at Stennis Space Center have, have made substantial successes uh, in the last few years. Um, and uh, largely, I think, because of the foundations that were laid by those who came before us, uh, and we have been successful in carrying through those with tremendous amount of support from NASA headquarters. Uh, starting with Admiral Truly, uh, J.R. Thompson, Dr. Lenore, uh, all have been very strong supporters of, of the emerging Stennis Space Center. Everybody from the people who gave up their land to the technicians, engineers, business people, uh, everybody who's had a part of this uh, has made, in my view, a major contribution to the country's uh, success in space. And the people of South Mississippi, South Louisiana, uh, that work here uh, have been the secret to that success. <laughs>